Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Matt Cooper with Deloitte Tax, and I'm going to be introducing our webinar for today. We are going to be talking about resolving collection due process issues with the Internal Revenue Service, as well as assisting taxpayers with low English proficiency and disabilities. This uh, webinar is going to be is presented on, on behalf of the Community Tax Law Project, and the moderator, Brad Riddle Hoover, will talk about the CTLP a little bit later today. With us, I'm honored to have Joshua Beck, who is a senior tax analyst with the IRS Taxpayer Advocate Service. Thank you, Josh. Chelsea Pearson, who's a senior attorney in small business, self-employed with the IRS Office of Chief Counsel out of Richmond. Thank you, Chelsea. Nancy Rosner, who's a senior staff attorney with the Community Tax Law Project. And then Bradley Riddlehoover will be the moderator. He's a partner with McGuire Woods and LLP. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brad to start us off. Thanks, Brad. Oh, thank you, Matt. Again, this is Brad Ruddle Hoover with McGuire Woods, and welcome to our annual webinar put on by the Community Tax Law Project. For those of you that are not familiar with CTLP, CTLP is one of the first uh, low-income taxpayer clinics founded in the U.S. It was founded in 1992 by Nina Olson, the former taxpayer advocate who recently retired. And we are delighted to have you here and appreciate our speakers joining us um, from wherever they're working these days. And so we're going to get started. Uh, obviously, we will go full two hours and CLE credit is being applied for and McGuire Woods will be reaching out to you once that's been uh, determined and provide you the necessary information. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, or you can contact our marketing consultant, Laura Bigger. Um, so you have that information, and we look forward to our time today. Uh, I will say that we'll be covering a lot of different topics, and I appreciate the speakers who have put together a great slide deck, which will be made available to the speakers or to the attendees after the presentation. We're also recording this. So feel free um, if you want to watch it again. For some reason, if you missed something, we'll provide the link for that also. You will see in, on your screen there is a Q&A option. If you have any questions today, feel free to type in the question. And as the moderator, I will try to work in the questions to our speakers as we move along. And if for some reason we don't get to all the questions or we feel like it needs to be addressed um, in more detail, we will collect the unanswered questions and contact you via email to address any further questions. But we look forward to today's presentation. Like uh, Matt said, we have people on this panel that are working at the IRS, the Taxpayer Advocate, the Chief Counsel's Office, and then we have people in private practice and pro bono counsel at Community Tax Law Project. So on behalf of the Community Tax Law Project, welcome, and we're gonna go ahead and get started. We do have a disclaimer on here. Uh, obviously, this is the views of the individuals, not in their official capacities. And I know those of you that have attended presentations before, our, our speakers will obviously give their disclaimers uh, to the extent necessary, but this is their views, not their uh, speaking on behalf of the agencies that they represent. And we look forward to a great presentation. As Matt said, this topic, the topics we're gonna cover today are three main topics. CDPs and collection alternatives, which are always something uh, as we're coming out of this pandemic or still in the middle of it for many people. Uh, collection issues are going to, I feel like, come back strong uh, from the IRS picking up collection measures that were a little bit slowed or stalled, stopped during the um, summer months. There's obviously also a topic on assisting taxpayers with low income proficiency, and we're gonna talk about um, some of the changes the IRS is making and some of the improvements on that front. And finally, we're gonna talk about assisting taxpayers with disabilities, which is, can be a challenge uh, for practitioners and the IRS, but we have some um, ideas that have been implemented and things that we're gonna talk about that maybe resources you're not aware of. So we look forward to having those uh, discussed today. All right, so let's get started. Thank you, Brad. Um, this is Chelsea Pearson. As um, was said previously, I'm a senior attorney with the IRS Office of Chief Counsel in Richmond, and I'm gonna be kicking us off on the CDP portion 
of this presentation. And hopefully you all have a bit of a background um, in collection due process, also known as CDP. Um, but if not, this is a very good primer um, overview of the collection due process. Um, process. So um, as a bit of a bit more of a disclaimer, anything I say during this webinar consists of my own opinions and statements and does not reflect the views of or represent the IRS or the IRS Office of Chief Counsel. So with that, how do we get to CDP? Well, first there must be an assessment and the IRS is going to issue notice and demand for payment of tax after that assessment. At that point, there's gonna be a series of demand letters that are, that are gonna be sent to the taxpayer asking the taxpayer to pay um, the amount of the liability. Um, and if the taxpayer fails to pay the amount of the tax liability in full, the account is going to either be assigned to the automated collection system known as ACS or to a revenue officer in a field collection group. And that's where we find ourselves in CDP. So there are- And Chelsea, and Chelsea, and Chelsea this is not, sorry. Sorry, this is not, yeah. I was gonna note. Um, as everyone probably knows, right? Sometimes the letters have um, similar language. It can, some of the language they use, um, similar terms. So they can be, the letters, and while you know, the IRS is trying to be very helpful, they can be confusing. So it's very important to read the letters to understand what letter you have and then what letters might be coming just so you can respond appropriately. Sorry, Brad, and I think you had a question. No, my only comment was, and I don't know if this is really Chelsea uh, seeing this, but Matt or Nancy, are you seeing um, a pickup you know, now that we've hit October in kind of the series of letters, I know there was kind of a lull for a few months um, when they were not sending out these letters, but if you starting to see clients get more of these kind of escalating letters, what's the status? Yeah, I think we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but the IRS did put a hold on a series of the um, intermediary letters, as I like to call them. And as far as I have not seen a pickup, I think there's a lot of them are still on hold. I don't know, Nancy, if you've seen anything differently, but I have not seen a pickup on these letters. And this is Nancy. We haven't seen a pickup either. I think we've been sort of holding our breath, waiting to see when that was going to come out, um, but we have not quite received those yet. So it seems like we're still sort of in this suspension period, though, you know, the official suspension period has ended. Okay, so I'm gonna, this is Chelsea again, I'm gonna jump back into just CDP, how we even get there. Um, so after this series of intermediary letters are sent out and the taxpayer fails to pay um, the tax liability in full, then there are potentially two CDP notices that can be issued um, after the account has been assigned to ACS or to a revenue officer. And I just wanna, Brad, if you wouldn't mind, thank you. I just don't know if there's a delay on my end. Um, so there's two potential letters. Um, there's a CDP levy notice, uh, which would be issued pursuant to IRC section 6330. Um, and that would be your final levy notice and your right to a hearing. This is generally sent prior to the levy actually occurring. Uh, the second notice would be a CDP lien notice um, issued pursuant to IRC section 6320. Um, this would be your notice of federal tax lien and your right to a hearing and that would be sent after the NFTL has actually been filed. Um, the CDP notice must be given in person, left at the taxpayer's dwelling or usual place of business, or delivered to the taxpayer's last known address by certified or registered mail. And if it's sent by mail, the CDP levy notice must be sent return receipt requested. Um, if a CDP hearing notice is not properly sent, the taxpayer uh, and the taxpayer fails to actually timely request a CDP hearing, the taxpayer would be entitled to substitute notice. And a substitute notice essentially just restarts the clock for requesting a CDP hearing. Um, and only the taxpayer is gonna have a right to that CDP hearing. So if the taxpayer receives the CDP notice and wants to request a CDP hearing, he or she would do so using form 12153. And the taxpayer would have to request the CDP hearing within 30 days. Um, for a lien hearing under section 6320, um, the request must be submitted no later than 30 days after the expiration of five business days after the date of the notice of federal tax lien, if that's not confusing. Um, and then uh, for a levy hearing under section 6330, um, the 
the, the request must be submitted no later than 30 days from the date of the CDP notice. And the 30 day time to request a CDP, CDP hearing is not extended for taxpayers residing outside of the United States. And on that um, form 12153, the taxpayer is also going to indicate why he or she disagrees with the lien or levy, and um, the taxpayer can also request collection alternatives. And now I'm going to turn it over to Nancy to talk a little bit about the timeliness of CDP hearing requests and equivalent hearings. Okay, great. Thanks, Chelsea. I just want to draw your attention to a couple of recent important updates when it comes to the timeliness of the request for a CDP hearing. Um, first, we have some technical advice from Chief Counsel's Office, and the memorandum is regarding revisions to the IRM for treatment of incorrectly addressed CDP hearing requests. Um, that was issued December 12th of 2019, and not too long after um, we received the memorandum, and both of these are available through the IRS website, um, but you can access the memorandum to issue guidance um, to the IRS, IRS based on the PMTA. Um, effective July 6, 2020 for CDP requests that were open in inventory or any new requests, and basically what the guidance says is now if um, a CDP hearing request is mailed to any of the addresses shown on the IRS notice advising of the taxpayer's right to a CDP hearing, it should be considered timely um, as of the date that it's uh, mailed, timely filing, timely mailing is timely filing. So as long as it's sent to one of the addresses on the CDP notice within the 30 days, it should be considered timely. Um, however, if it is sent to an address that is not one of the addresses in the CDP notice, then it will um, be treated as being filed when it is received by the proper office. So this is definitely a positive step in the right direction. What we're seeing as practitioners is sometimes it can be a little confusing when the taxpayer or the practitioner receives a copy of the IRS notice giving the taxpayer a right to request a hearing. Oftentimes there's one address on the top, there's another address maybe included with a voucher for payment and uh, taxpayers can get confused about which address they should use when sending their request for a CDP hearing into the IRS. Um, so really glad to see that the IRS is, is making this change and I think it's definitely a uh, move in the right direction. Yeah, and, and then again, I, just you, I think that was a sorry. I was going to say that was a change. I think from I think there was a 2013 advice from the chief counsel that advised otherwise. I think, like you said, it was a it's good for taxpayers as it was a reversing course and being more taxpayer favorable. Nancy, how do yes, you definitely. prove the mailing issue if there's a controversy? What what do you recommend? to make sure that the taxpayer preserves their rights to keep the um, CDP hearing, we'll talk about the equivalency here in a second, but to, if there is an issue here, how would you recommend they, they make sure that there's proof they have on the timeline? Sure, that's a great question. Uh, generally what we do at our office is we'll send the CDP hearing request via certified mail. And not only will I put you know the sticker on the envelope with the certified tracking um, number, but I also put that tracking number on the letter itself, so on the cover letter enclosing the 12153. That way, if there's ever a question, we've got the tracking, and then we've got the tracking number on the letter, so it would be hard, I think, for the IRS to dispute that, you know, that tracking number wasn't related to that particular package, and then we always want to make sure that we're getting that postmarked um, by the deadline for requesting the hearing. So if we're getting really close to the deadline, I will not just put it in the mailbox. I will go to the post office and have them stamp the receipt for me um, so that, that if it is later called into question that we have adequate proof that it was mailed um, in a timely fashion. Okay, great. So moving on to equivalent hearings, just wanted to touch upon this. Chelsea mentioned equivalent hearings. In the 12153, um, on the second page, there is a box where you can check 
um, to request an equivalent hearing if the IRS deems that the CDP hearing request was not timely. So as a practice point, we always check that box um, just in case as a matter of precaution. But you do have, the taxpayer does have a right to a, an equivalent hearing within one year um, from the date of the, you know, the CD where you would have been granted the rights for a CDP hearing. So um, maybe you were representing the client at that time or maybe not if you happen to look at the account transcript for the account for that taxpayer um, for, you know, the year that they might owe. You should be able to see on there if the CDP letter was sent to the taxpayer um, and you can count forward a year and if you're still within that time period you may want to consider requesting an equivalent hearing which would give you the opportunity to talk with someone in appeals about your taxpayer's case instead of dealing with the collections department there are a few differences though with the equivalent hearing the statute of limitations is not told and the irs determination from the hearing is not going to be appealable to the tax court as it would with a collection due process hearing. Um, further, with the collection due process hearing, usually the statute of limitations is told, um, but that doesn't happen here. And collection is usually told with an equivalent hearing, the IRS is not required to toll collections, but it seems like as a matter of course, they generally will cease collection on um, the tax periods that are subject to the equivalent hearing or the NFTL hearing. Um, and it looks like they, they may also cease collection just generally on, on all balances owed. We see here the note, though, that the IRS may still determine that it is necessary to continue to levy. And there's a few factors that the IRS would consider, and they're present in that IRM cited there. And those factors are, um, first, that if the collection of the tax debt is at risk, so if the IRS is concerned that the taxpayer may be dissipating assets, and then the IRS would lose its opportunity to levy or lean against those assets, the IRS may move forward with collection activity despite the request for the equivalent hearing. Secondly, if the taxpayer is raising frivolous issues, so if the IRS determines that um, the case is not meritorious, then the IRS may then continue with collections. And lastly, if the taxpayer is requesting or if the IRS determines that the taxpayer is requesting an installment agreement or an offer and compromise simply to delay the process, then the IRS may move ahead um, with, with levy action in that situation as well. So the equivalent hearing doesn't protect the taxpayer in the same way that a collection due process hearing would. Yeah, and Nancy, I see this come up with the equivalency hearing either because the taxpayer, for whatever reason, or the representative doesn't get the final notice giving the right to go to collection due process appeals until, you know, there may be only a day or two left, or even sometimes you get the notice, like you said, after the 30 days has already elapsed, and so then you can go to equivalency hearing. And the other thing I like to point out is you you have to request this on a 12-153 for both a lien and levy, so you might get a, a final levy notice and you request a 12-153 and then you get a lien notice or vice versa, and then you should still do the 12-153 for the CD peering for both, uh, I don't know if you see that as well, Nancy, but that's where I see it come up quite often. Right, you would definitely wanna respond to each of those um, separately because the IRS will issue the notice of the levy prior to a levy being issued, but we see with the liens that once the lien has been filed, then the IRS offers the right to a hearing to challenge the lien. So those would probably want to be treated as separate um, requests for hearings to di discuss each of those separate collection actions on behalf of the IRS. Right. And then so the other I situation before I turn back to Chelsea is uh, yeah. the other situation where I see come up is with civil penalties. So a lot of times with you know, late information returns, 5471s, 5472s, or the IRS has a campaign for foreign trusts, 3520s and 3520As, where the IRS will assess the penalty, and then you get the notices, and a lot of times, again, we're seeing those where you get the CDP notices. So that's just an area, if you have any clients with international filing, that comes up quite often. Mm -hmm. 
So I think Nancy and um, Matt just answered the question we had, which said, and I don't know if you guys can all see the question, so I'm just going to read it. It said, do you request the CDP hearing after the letter 11 or after the lien notice? Um, as Nancy and Matt just said, um, you know, they would recommend that you would request a CDP, CDP hearing after both. Um, but there is, you would get separate notices for both a levy um, CDP hearing and for um, a lien CDP hearing. Um, so you would be able to request a CDP hearing after each one of them. Um, and they may not, depending on the taxpayer and, and what's going on with that taxpayer's um, account, um, you may not get the levy notice first and then have the lien notice issued afterwards. It could be the lien notice coming first and then the levy notice um, issued after that. It's just going to vary depending on the taxpayer. So um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier in the presentation on the form 12153, the taxpayer can explain why he or she um, might disagree with the lien or the levy. Um, and one of the reasons the taxpayer might disagree would be that he asserts that he didn't have a prior opportunity to challenge the underlying liability. Um, so there's two ways under Section 6330 C2B that the taxpayer can challenge the underlying liability. The first is to assert that he did not receive any statutory notice of deficiency for the tax liability. And the second one would be um, that he didn't otherwise have an opportunity to dispute such tax liability. And so I'm going to discuss both of them um, in turn. So the first way that a taxpayer can challenge the underlying liability is by asserting that he didn't receive a notice of deficiency for the tax liability at issue in the CDP, he CDP hearing. Um, so what does receipt actually mean? Receipt means that the taxpayer had sufficient time to petition the tax court. Um, so as I'm sure most of you all know, um, there's generally 90 days to petition the tax court from a notice of deficiency. It would be 150 if the taxpayer um, is living abroad. Um, there's been several court cases on this particular issue on what sufficient time to petition the tax court means. Um, one case said that 30 days left to petition the tax court is sufficient. Um, another one said that 17 days left to petition is generally insufficient. Um, so there's probably a sweet spot somewhere in between, but as far as I'm aware, um, there hasn't been any updated case law um, since then. Um, so we're somewhere in between 17 and 30 days as to what is sufficient in terms of timeliness to petition. Um, if the taxpayer asserts that he didn't receive the notice of deficiency, the IRS is going to have to show that the notice of deficiency was mailed and received. Um, so the IRS often shows this by producing a copy of the notice of deficiency and a copy of the certified mailing list that shows when and where the notice was mailed. Um, and sometimes no one refutes that the notice of deficiency was mailed, uh, but the taxpayer asserts he or she did not actually receive the notice of deficiency. In this case, the IRS can attempt to show actual receipt by providing the signed certified mail tracker, which would be that little green USPS card, um, if you guys have ever seen that when you've done certified tracking. Um, but those are oftentimes not available or they're illegible. Um, so what would happen in that sort of situation? Um, in that case where there's no direct evidence the taxpayer actually received the notice, uh, the IRS would rely on the presumptions of official regularity and proper delivery to, prov to prove receipt. Um, and what does that really mean? Um, it means that um, mailing by certified mail to the taxpayer's last known address, and if the certified mail list shows the notice of deficiency was mailed to the taxpayer's last known address, there's a strong presumption in the law that a properly addressed letter will be delivered or at least offered for delivery to the addressee. Um, and then at that point, once the government's shown that, the burden would shift to the taxpayer to um, rebut that presumption that the, that the notice of deficiency was delivered or that delivery was attempted. Um, and there's a couple of different cases where the taxpayer was able to rebut the presumption. In one, the taxpayer was in prison when the notice of deficiency was mailed to his last known address. In another, um, the notice of deficiency was returned to the IRS as undeliverable, um, and the taxpayer didn't actually receive the notice. Um, the um, taxpayer can also deny that they received um, the notice of attempted delivery, um, and the tax court has found in that case sometimes that um, that was potentially sufficient to rebut the presumption. Um, however, an unclaimed notice of deficiency does not rebut the presumption. 
um, if the taxpayer admits to receiving the notice of attempted delivery but then fails to pick up the certified mail, um, the taxpayer has not rebutted the presumption of official regularity and proper delivery. So that's the first way to challenge um, the underlying liability in the CDP hearing, uh, where the taxpayer asserts he didn't receive the notice of deficiency for the tax liability at issue in the CDP hearing. The second way to challenge the underlying so think, liability, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Nancy. That's okay, I was just gonna jump in. I mean, I think one of the interesting points here um, is that if the taxpayer basically refuses to go get the mail or to receive the mail, that doesn't protect them from the, starting of the clock for the statutory notice of deficiency. So, you know, the 90 days is still going to start if they're basically just trying to refuse to receive the mail. So as long as the IRS is sending it to the last known address and meeting those criteria and can, you know, prove um, reasonably that it was sent to the taxpayer where they should have received it, um, then that will start the clock. So just because the taxpayer doesn't physically um, receive it doesn't mean that, um, you know, the clock doesn't start. So we have had that come up in situations before, and unfortunately, you know, those may not end in the taxpayer's favor. But there are ways to challenge receipt, um, you know, if, if the taxpayer made reasonable efforts to change their address with the IRS, sent in a new tax return or change of address form, and the requisite amount of time has passed, and maybe IRS didn't send it to the proper address, um, you know, there are ways to challenge uh, receipt. As Chelsea mentioned, there's a few different cases in this area, but simply, you know, not picking up the mail is not going to be sufficient. Thanks, Nancy. Um, so the second way to challenge the underlying liability is that the taxpayer did not otherwise have a prior opportunity to contest the liability. And um, trust fund recovery penalties or TFRPs are a fun kind of in-between notice. Um, so you'll see in case law that oftentimes the TFRP letter or the, 11, the letter 1153 is related to, it, they, they relate it to the notice of deficiency. Um, for example, you'll find case law that says um, the government has the burden on presumption that the letter 1153 was delivered and the IRS must show that the letter was properly sent to the taxpayer. And similarly, um, a taxpayer who deliberately refuses to accept delivery of a letter 1153 um, would not be able to rebut um, the presumption that the government generally has. Um, but there is some recent case law that just came out actually out of a case out of Richmond this summer um, where it, the court found that um, the taxpayer actually receiving the letter 1153 may not be sufficient to determine that there was a prior opportunity. So that case is Barnhill, um, and the site is 155 T.C. number one um, out of 2020, um, and I'll cite it to it a little bit later in the presentation if you missed that. Um, but in that one, in, in Barnhill, a taxpayer requested a TFRP hearing. Um, but did not receive appeals as follow-up letter setting the date and time of the hearing. And because the taxpayer didn't receive the letter, he didn't actually participate in the TFRP hearing with appeals. And then two days later, after the taxpayer didn't participate in the hearing, the appeals officer just closed the case without attempting any sort of additional follow-up with the taxpayer. And the court, like I said, determined that this set of facts was sufficient to conclude that the taxpayer was deprived of his opportunity to participate in an appeals conference. And therefore, he did not have a prior opportunity and should not have been precluded from later disputing his liability at his CDP hearing. Um, okay, so we all know that there was no receipt of a notice of deficiency. Um, we've talked a little bit about this already. So the question, next question is, was there otherwise a prior opportunity to contest the liability and, and what does that mean? So this is a, a much longer story than we have time for today, but there's just a few highlights. Generally, a prior opportunity includes a conference at appeals that's offered either before or after the assessment of the tax. And a prior opportunity does not mean that there must be an opportunity for judicial review. So taxes that are not subject to deficiency procedures may have prior opportunities to, con to contest the liability that were administrative opportunities only. Um, and the most simple example of a prior opportunity is when um, the taxpayer had an opportunity for a prior CDP hearing for the same taxable period. Um, so if the taxpayer received a CDP levy notice and either had a hearing or didn't, um, when and if the taxpayer gets a CDP lien notice, the taxpayer is not going to get a second opportunity to contest the liability in that second hearing. 
So just a basic recap of kind of what we've been touching on um, in the previous slides is taxpayers generally considered to have not had a prior opportunity to contest the underlying liability if the taxpayer did not receive a notice of deficiency, if the taxpayer did not receive a letter 1153 for trust fund recovery penalties, um, if the taxpayer self-reported his or her taxes and has not yet had the opportunity to contest the liability, um, or if the taxpayer previously had a prior opportunity for the tax period at issue, but there's a new assessment made by the IRS on that tax period, then that would not be a prior opportunity. So we've gone over at this point when a taxpayer has already had an opportunity to contest the underlying liability and therefore can't contest it at the CDP hearing. Um, but we really haven't discussed what underlying liability really means or when and what, it, uh, what can be challenged. So as you can see on the slide, underlying liability basically means tax imposed by the Internal Revenue Code. Um, and it's also been that phrase underlying tax liability has also been defined by the tax court as the tax on which the commissioner based his assessment. And um, case law has also found that underlying tax liability includes the total amount of tax, which would include interest and penalties, assessed for a particular tax period, including tax assessed under deficiency procedures, tax reported on a tax return, or a combination of both. So when can a challenge to the underlying liability be raised. Um, so a taxpayer is precluded from disputing the underlying liability in a CDP judicial review proceeding if the taxpayer failed to properly raise the merits of the underlying tax liability as an issue during the CDP hearing. Um, but taxpayers are not precluded from raising liability simply because they didn't raise the issue in the 12-153 hearing request. So I think either myself or Nancy um, mentioned earlier that um, there's a, a couple sections on the 12-153 where you can say um, what the issues are that you have. Um, just because the taxpayer doesn't say liability on the 12-153 does not mean that he did not raise the merits. Um, if the taxpayer raises liability at any time during the CDP hearing, that means liability is properly raised. Um, however, there's always a however, um, the taxpayer is not, the merits of liability are not properly raised if the taxpayer fails to present appeals with any evidence about that liability after being given a reasonable opportunity to present the evidence. So, for example, if taxpayer says, I'm contesting my liability and says it whether they're within the CDP hearing or on the 12 one and the appeals officer gives the taxpayer a reasonable opportunity to file an amended return or to provide requested information to substantiate his liability challenge, but then the taxpayer fails to do so, the taxpayer did not properly um, raise the merits of the, of the liability. And um, what can be challenged? Um, generally, the amount of the tax reported on the filed return is what can be challenged. Um, but even non-filers can challenge. Um, just because a taxpayer failed to file a tax return doesn't necessarily preclude him or her from raising the underlying liability. Um, if the taxpayer provides evidence substantiating, usually it's deductions, um, at the CDP hearing. Um, but again, if you don't provide that substantiating um, documentation to the appeals officer or provide an amended return, um, the taxpayer would be later precluded from challenging the liability. And um, the IRS um, in CC Notice 2014-002 um, states a couple of positions about non-liability issues, so things that the IRS would consider um, not to be a challenge to the underlying liability. And some of those issues are whether the assessment is valid, whether the assessment and collection statute of limitations periods were complied with, and issues involving the amount of payments and overpayment credits the taxpayer has made and their proper application. Yeah, and Chelsea, this is Matt. I would just add, um, this is a practice tip. If, if a representative, if you haven't been involved for a taxpayer all along, or even if you have, um, the, you know, the best thing is always to both call the IRS, but either practitioner priority line or collection if it's already assigned to collection, but then also verify by pulling the IRS transcripts to see what is shown on the IRS records as to all the notices that have been issued so far, hopefully, see, 
just so you have a sense of what's gone on in the past, whether the taxpayer has received a stat notice, whether there's been other notices that have been issued. So it's just, again, it's common sense, but it's always a, very, it's a good starting point to pull the IRS transcript to see what's being shown. So Matt, I think that's a great scenario tip, Matt. where, yeah, Nancy or Matt, either one can answer this. So in the I, scenario where we run into the situation that they had a chance to contest it, they didn't properly do so, but they, we still believe there are liability issues um, you know, that could be corrected. So what are your, well, maybe start with Nancy. What do you do in that scenario um, where procedurally they've, they've, you know, faulted, but, you know, you still think there's a substantive question? Um, yeah, I'll start. Probably right. what I would do. Oh, so, no, go ahead, Nancy. I'll start, Matt, and then I'll turn it over to you. I think what I would do in that situation is, you know, I would address the collection side of things. If we're unable to challenge the liability through the hearing, then we would just have to do it through another administrative procedure. So I would use the CDP hearing to try to come up with a collection alternative that works for the client, whether it's, um, you know, a payment plan or a hardship status, which is usually what we're seeing, you know, with our clients at the clinic. And then once the client is protected from IRS collection activity, we would work on other remedies. So if we're asking the IRS to reconsider the audit of the tax return if the IRS did go ahead and make changes to the taxpayer's account um, that were different from what the taxpayer originally filed. We would probably submit an audit reconsideration request to the IRS, um, also potentially an amended tax return, maybe if you're trying to request changes from the original return that was filed. Um, so it would probably be a two-step approach uh, because you'd have to secure some sort of collection alternative first to make sure that the client is protected from collection activity and then move ahead with the administrative procedures available to you. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I'm similar to what I was going to say, and sorry, Nancy, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, and then, yeah, try and deal with collection. There's audit reconsideration. You can always, depending on the taxpayer's financial, you know, wherewithal, they could always pay and file a refund claim um, to, to try and challenge the liability if they have the ability to pay. And then always a good resource. I'll give a plug to Josh and his uh, his team. Taxpayer Advocates Office is always a great resource. And I know Nancy uses them a lot, and I use them a lot for a variety of situations to help with a variety of IRS issues. And that's going to kind of move us into the next part of our CDP discussion, which um, it is, if, you know, in addition to potentially challenging the underlying liability I mentioned, and the taxpayer, you know, hasn't had a prior opportunity, the taxpayer can also raise collection alternatives as part of the CDP hearing. Um, so on this slide are just several examples of collection alternatives that the taxpayer can request um, during the CDP hearing or on the 12-153. And the two most common collection alternatives raised at a CDP hearing are requests for an offering compromise or an OIC pursuant to Section 7122, or a request for an installment agreement pursuant to Section 6159. And I'm going to turn it over to Matt to discuss those more. Thanks, Chelsea. Um, so I'm going to start with just talking about installment agreements. So there's a variety of ways you can make payments to the IRS, full payments, um, payment plans. There's short-term payments of generally 120 days or less. If you have oh, less than $100,000 or long-term um, installment agreement where you're asking for uh, more than 120 days. So the installment agreement allows the taxpayer to, as it sounds, pay in installments, a liability over a period of time. It includes tax, but it also include, includes uh, interest and penalties, as, as usual. Um, and the good thing about uh, installment agreement is that it has an effect on collection activity where the IRS may not levy when the installment agreement request is filed or pending, as well as 30 days following um, rejection, termination, or appeal. And then importantly as well, the collection statute, uh, statute limitations is suspended under 6331, See, that's important. You need to know that your collection statute, the 10 year statute, is suspended during the installment agreement. So, what's the process for reaching an installment agreement? Um, the IRS will generally, um, not, not surprisingly, will want the taxpayer to pay as much of the liability as possible upfront. 
Um, so that's something you need to consider. To how much can your client pay? How much are they willing to pay? Um, and then the taxpayer can will um, make the request and then suggest the amount that they can pay each month. There's the form 9465, which is the form to request it. But then you can also do it online, um, over phone, or in person. And then the fourth, the 433 series is the financial information series. There is a user fee for most, um, depend, unless you can qualify for an exception. And how much you pay depends on if you're going to do um, pay using direct deposit. Um, are you making the application for an installment agreement online or um, are you making a non-direct deposit in a check or other type of payment and then phone, mail, or in person? So that all these go into the factors as to how much of the user fee. Um, and then depending on the type of um, installment agreement, the IRS will want the initial installment payment paid so that you're paying that first um, share of the installment agreement. But installment agreements are just, again, a great collection alternative to consider um, for the appropriate taxpayer. And then the other main collection alternative is, is offer and compromise. And so that's offer and compromise is when the taxpayer is un, unable to pay the full amount and it's unlikely, the IRS deems it's unlikely that they will be able to collect in full and they're willing to agree to the compromise of the liability. The OIC re must reasonably reflect the collection potential um, for the taxpayer. And the bullets here list the reason why um, OICs are beneficial both to the IRS and to the taxpayer, because it allows the collection of what reasonably could be collected at the earliest possible time and at the least cost to the government. It, um, obviously, if there's a revenue officer assigned to collect the liability, that's resources and time spent by the revenue officer to try and collect the liability over a certain amount. So the offer and compromise in a lot of situations can help achieve a resolution that's in the best interest of the IRS and the taxpayer and also allow the taxpayer to get a fresh start at the same time. So usually it's a usually it's a win win in the right situation. And then again, collect liability that may not be collected in any other way. The, uh, the form six five six is the, the the official offer and compromise form. It requests a lot of information. Not surprisingly, the IRS wants to make sure that they're only using the offer and compromise in the appropriate situations. You have to include a statement of support of the offer, which outlines the terms. If the taxpayer is in bankruptcy, you cannot use the OIC process. You have to identify the liability. There is a user fee of $205. Um, and then most importantly, you have to lay out the taxpayer's financial information um, in, in, de in pretty significant detail um, as to why the taxpayer qualifies for the offer and compromise. The IRS will review the form 656 and the other information provided and then make a decision as to whether they're going to accept it. They, they, the, you know, they, the IRS should give notice as to whether or not the offer is accepted, but if it's not accepted in 24 months, there's a deemed acceptance. And then it's important to note that if the offer is for $50,000 or more, then um, Chelsea's group or someone else in the IRS office of chief counsel needs to get um, involved and review so that they can uh, they can make sure that they agree with the offer and compromise and that the IRS is not agreeing to something that the, um, the, the IRS counsel attorneys think that might be problematic later on. And then the, the other piece yeah. that we wanted to just brief. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, um, I was just going to back up. I mean, I was going to jump in earlier, but I don't want to interrupt. But in regards to the installment agreement section, um, I just wanted to make mention that, you know, uh, the IRS is using private collection agencies um, that was required of them by the FAST Act uh, back in like 2015. And so I just wanted people to be aware, this is Josh, by the way, um, that, you know, you may not be contacted, you know, by an IRS uh, ACS person to get into an installment agreement, but you're, you or your or the taxpayer may be contacted by a private collection agency to get them into an installment agreement. And um, those installment agreements are largely um, standard, you know, installment agreements where they wouldn't have financial, you know, they wouldn't, you know, they would just it would be a 
you know, every month you would pay a certain amount until the liability is, is um, you know, is satisfied. Um, so if you wanted to do an OIC um, or you wanted to get into CNC hardship status or you wanted an installment agreement that is, you know, varies, we, we'll see sometimes where, you know, there's contractors and stuff and they can pay more certain time of the year than the other time of year. Those would be the sort of things that you could um, – you would request to get your a case out of the private collection agency inventory, um, and you could come into TAS to um, help you, you know, help work that and and get that issue resolved. So I just wanted to point out there that, um, you know, that is something that the IRS is doing, sending a number of these cases over to private collection agencies for installment agreements. So it's something to consider. Thanks, Josh. That's Thanks, very Josh, helpful. This is Nancy. I want to jump in real quick, Matt, just to talk in terms of a practice tip. Um, if you are looking to submit an offer and compromise and you've got a potential CDP request, you know, you're anticipating that you're going to get a CDP request because the IRS sends notices in the same order, you know, starting with the 504 and then sort of um, proceeding until you get the uh, offer for the CDP hearing to make the CDP hearing request. In my experience, it can be pretty helpful to wait to submit your offer until you're in CDP. So though you might have the offer ready to go, maybe waiting until you request a CDP hearing. And the reason for that is because then you get a second level of review, essentially. So the CDP officer would open up a CDP case, but then the offer and compromise would go to the centralized offer and compromise unit, and they would basically suggest or recommend what they think, um, you know, the result should be, whether it's accepted or not. And then the appeals officer also gets to um, decide if they feel like that, you know, if they've determined that that is the proper solution or not. So sometimes it can give you a second level of review, and that can be nice um, when you're dealing with offers and compromise, especially if it's one that might be a little tricky. We had one, we were doing um, like a public policy type offer and compromise, the taxpayer was scammed out of um, a pretty large amount of money and she then ended up with a bunch of tax debt um, resulting from this scam where she had, you know, emptied out basically her and her husband's retirement. Um, but, you know, the scammer was supposed to pay the taxes or take care of that and file the returns and of course um, didn't do that properly. So the taxpayer ended up with a bunch of debt. Um, and in that case, the OIC got sent out and then sent back, and unfortunately they were recommending um, rejection. But when I was researching the issue, I found that it wasn't sent to the proper sort of subgroup in the IRS that it should have been reviewed by. And since we were in CDP, I was able to express that to the CDP officer, um, you know, and point to the IRM, and, and they agreed. And then they resent the OIC out to a different um, you know, sort of subgroup that reviewed those particular types of offers. Um, so that was an interesting situation that probably is going to come up pretty often. But I think if you've got an offer that maybe not be super, maybe isn't super straightforward, it might be good to consider um, submitting that through CDP. Thanks, Nancy. Um, yeah, no, that's a great tip. And then Josh, thanks for reminding me to mention the private delight collection. Um, that's an important thing to keep in mind. I believe the IRS put on put that on hold, sending new cases to the private debt collection during COVID, but during the People First Act, which we'll talk about in a second, but that was a helpful point. Um, and then briefly, I just wanted to mention before I turn back to Chelsea, there is also currently not collectible status if the taxpayer can demonstrate that they do not have the necessary living expenses after paying, you know, do not have the, do not have the income after paying necessary living expenses to pay the IRS, then the IRS can put the taxpayer into CNC or currently not collectible status. Again, the IRS is going to want documentation to support that fact. So that's always important to, to provide the appropriate documentation. And then the taxpayer will stay in that status as long as the financial situation remains the same. Obviously, if the taxpayer wins the lotto or somehow their financial situation improve significantly, then the IRS always has the right to reconsider as well um, and take into account and then reconsider what status they're going to be in. And then the IRS will take into account assets in addition to monthly income versus expenses. Um, so it's important to know 
is make sure the taxpayer is disclosing all appropriate assets um, and make it, letting the IRS make their determination. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back to Chelsea to, to briefly cover um, judicial review of CDP. Thanks, Matt. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be very brief. On judicial review, we're just wrapping up the CDP hearing. Um, essentially, after the CDP hearing, taxpayer would um, be issued a notice of determination concerning collection action, um, which is a ticket to tax court. Um, the taxpayer is going to have 30 days from the date of the notice of determination notice of determination um, in which to appeal that determination to the tax court. Um, and Nancy, um, a little earlier, um, discussed equivalent hearings. If a taxpayer receives an equivalent hearing, um, that hearing is going to culminate not in the issuance of a notice of determination, but instead in the issuance of a decision letter. Um, and it will be called that a decision letter. Um, and that is not a ticket to tax court and it's not going to be subject to judicial review. So once a taxpayer actually gets the tax court, um, he can only raise issues that were properly raised during the CDP hearing, and that includes challenges to the underlying liability. So an issue is not properly raised if the taxpayer fails to request consideration of the issue by appeals, um, but again, or if, you know, if consideration is requested, but then the taxpayer fails to present to appeals any evidence um, with respect to that issue after being given a reasonable time um, to present evidence. Um, the only um, caveat to that is that the court will review um, whether appeals verified compliance with applicable law, regardless of whether the taxpayer raised that issue at the CDP hearing. Um, and then if underlying liability is properly at issue, the tax court is going to review the issue de novo and all other administrative determinations are going to be reviewed for an abuse of discretion. Uh, de novo means that the court is not limited to reviewing the record before appeals and can hold a trial and take new evidence and testimony. Um, if liability is not at issue at all, the tax court is going to review the entire determination for abuse of discretion. And essentially that means that the tax court will generally overturn a determination it reviews for abuse of discretion in CDP cases. Um, if the determination is arbitrary, capricious, clearly unlawful, or without sound basis in fact or law. Um, in terms of the administrative record, the IRS's opinion is that review under an abuse of discretion standard is limited to the administrative record. Um, the tax court has held as a general rule that it's not limited to the administrative record, um, but the court will apply the record rule um, in CDP cases that are appealable to the first, eighth, and ninth circuits because those courts have held that abuse of discretion review is generally limited to the administrative record. And I'm going to turn it back to Matt and Nancy. So I think just a quick um, second on this slide, um, the important practice point here is if you're working through CDP, it's just really important to build the administrative record, especially if it's something that may end up in the tax court because they will be looking to that record. So making sure to document everything, um, maybe even, you know, maybe you've spoken it to the appeals officer, but also following up with a fax just documenting your main points if it is possible that, you know, you're anticipating this may go to tax court. And, and even if not, I think it's always good to document your position in case it's later called into question. And that can be done, I believe, until the, the actual proceeding is closed. So maybe you've had the hearing already. Um, you would still have some time to send in documentation or letters or what have you to try to support your position that would then be included in the administrative record that may later be reviewed by the tax court if you do appeal the determination. Hey, Nancy, Thank this you. is Josh. Can I just add one thing about um, the CNC discussion real quick? Oh, sure. Um, I just wanted to point out that we've worked a lot in TAS um, to make sure that the ACS employees were um, have been trained on the Vinatieri case and that, you know, CNC hardship in those situations can't be um, denied for um, unfiled returns. I occasionally will still hear that um, practitioners or taxpayers get pushed back on that issue, um, but I just wanted to point out that that shouldn't be a barrier to getting your client in um, placed into C C and C hardship and the IRM, you know, does, you know, has been, you know, does clearly state that, um, you know, so just make sure that, you know, if you do get pushed back, um, you know, that you kind of bring that to their attention. 
Yeah, I think that's a great point, Josh. Um, and, and every now and then we do get a little bit of pushback. Um, you know, if there are unfiled returns that the taxpayer is required to file, but they're trying to get into CNC, it shouldn't be a bar uh, to CNC. So that's great that TAS has been doing so much work to just make sure that all IRS um, representatives are aware of that because it, you know, only helps to protect our taxpayers um, and enable us to advocate for them and get them into um, a safer status with the IRS. Um, and and that just kind of reminded me of something that I just want to mention. You know, when you're when you've requested the CDP hearing, it usually takes a little time before you get the letter from the IRS saying, you know, I'm your appeals officer, so and so, and I'm scheduling a hearing for the state in this time. And I think it's really, really important to read that letter in its entirety. Um, I've been guilty of glossing over it at first glance, but the letter details exactly what the appeals officer is looking for. And I have noticed that sometimes it varies from appeals officer to appeals officer. So generally, you know, if you're talking about a collection alternative, you know, like a payment plan or CNC, they may want the 433A. Um, but in the letter, they will also note whether they want to see supporting documents or not, or specifically what they want to see. But then also they'll note whether the taxpayer has unfiled tax returns. So especially for those cases that, you know, the taxpayer is coming in at the last second and you're trying to help them, but maybe you haven't had enough time to adequately research their compliance um, with tax return filings, et cetera, definitely pay close attention to the letter from appeals because it should let you know if there are unfiled returns that they're expecting either to see filed or usually they'll accept a statement if, if you determine the taxpayer didn't have a filing requirement, then usually you do have to inform them of that instead. All right, I think then we're just gonna, um, before we go to the next section, talk about COVID-19 impact on collection. Like everything else, COVID has had an impact on the IRS and its employees like it has it on everyone else. And so the IRS came out with the People's First initiative in March, I believe, March 25th, which the idea, the point was to assist taxpayers with um, some easing of payments, guidelines to postponing of IRS compliance. And the People's First initiative was through July 15, 2020, which was the same date the IRS provided relief for most filings that were due between April 15th and July 15th in notice 2020-23. Um, after July 15th, 2020, the IRS came out with a series of collection memoranda, which we have linked to, that provide the guidance to um, IRS collection employees, um, ACS, revenue officers, and other people who are involved in collection. Um, so we link to those, so it's um, helpful to read those about what, um, what, what collection actions the IRS is taking. Generally, it's allowing collection, restarting collection as appropriate. A lot of it is talking about when there would be face-to-face, -face, which obviously will be limited for the foreseeable future. Um, and then we wanted to briefly mention there's also an FAQ on the release of lien. So if you go to the IRS coronavirus website, there's a whole host of information, including those memos and other information. So I would always, I would highly recommend Googling just IRS coronavirus, IRS coronavirus operations. And the FAQ says that uh, what should a taxpayer do if they need a lien release, certificate of discharge, or have another lien issue? And the answer is the IRS is processing all lien certificate applications normally and assigning them within 10 days. But then the IRS is encouraging taxpayers to use the e-fax line for their advisory consolidated receipts and has the number 844-201-8382, 844-201-8382. And so that's, you can do the e-fax. And so the great thing about the e-fax is you don't have to send in paper and it should go to someone's desk for processing. So that relates to discharge of property for federal tax lien, withdrawal of notice of federal tax lien, and subordination of the federal tax lien. So that's a great uh, resource for people to have. And then um, the last thing we wanted to briefly mention before we go back, turn back to Chelsea is IRS issues arising from IRS suspension of notice mailings. As you all know, the IRS has 
is dealing with a huge backlog of paper correspondence relating to COVID. At one point in the press, it was, I think, over 10 million pieces of paper. I think now it's hopefully under 5 million, but there still is a decent amount of paper that needs to be processed by the IRS. Um, so the IRS is working um, diligently to try to uh, to get out responses. But if you, I'm sure all of you have, everyone on the phone probably has sent in some correspondence and is waiting to hear back. So it's just going to take time to get through all the documents. Many of the notices that the IRS were mail were were mailing out were delayed, so they put in an insert a notice 1052 to provide you more time to provide to pay or provide a response. But I think the practice tip is it's very important to document all your responses to the IRS. Um, I know Taxpayer Advocates Office is swamped um, with requests just because a lot of people more people are going to them because of all the backlog and um, backlogs in the system. But again, I would just recommend make sure you document any responses, follow up to the extent possible. And, you know, the taxpayers are going to have to understand it's going to take a while for a lot of these issues to be resolved. So you just want to make sure um, you have proof of what you sent in, when you did, um, and to make sure that, you know, in case something goes wrong. And then the other thing is the IRS did stop mail. We mentioned this earlier at the beginning. The IRS did stop mailing of many of the collection notices, the CP 501, 503, and 504. So those were the um, collection notices that go out after the initial assessment and notice in demand and before the final notice of intent to levy um, and the final notice that gives you the right to go to CDP for the liens. So, uh, we, we, and again, we have, as we mentioned, we haven't seen those starting up yet, um, yet, but it, it might be... Uh, Hopefully, or maybe in the in the near future, and then the other issue that has arisen is because the IRS and the tax court were not processing a notice of deficiency. Um, there were some situations where, I mean, sorry, petitions to tax court. There were situations where the IRS made assessments because they did not know that the tax the taxpayer had petitioned the tax court. So both the tax court and the IRS and IRS Office of Chief Counsel are aware of these potential premature, premature assessments. So if you have any of those, the IRS is very interested in knowing about those. They set up an email where you can notify them, but reach out to um, some. I, I have the email if you need it. If you don't have it, it was in the press. And please let you know if, if there is an assessment that was premature because the IRS did not know that a taxpayer had petitioned the court important to reach out to let the IRS know so that they can uh, take corrective action. And uh, I and think I Chelsea was going to briefly mention. Yep, go ahead. Matt, I just wanted to add, I think even on a good day, you have to be really pay close attention um, because I, prior to the pandemic, I've had situations where I've sent the CDP hearing request timely via certified mail, you know, close to the last day um, that it needed to be sent out. And due to what was IRS determined, you know, we, we submitted a SAMS on this issue, so we reported this as a potential systemic problem because it happened in a couple of my cases, but IRS determined it was a timing issue. But despite me sending in the timely CDP hearing request, the IRS um, proceeded, continued to proceed with the next sort of notice stream that they were going to move ahead with levy action. Um, so that's an important thing to keep an eye out for because it can come up um, where you're requesting you're submitting the CDP request and the IRS system is, you know, programmed to just crank out that next letter. Um, so I think in those situations, I was able to fix that by contacting um, the collections department and, you know, letting them know I sent the timely CDP hearing request. Usually at that time, they can see it in the system and they can put a stop on, um, you know, the further collection notices, or they can let me know if it's been opened up in appeals and therefore should be um, protected from levy action, uh, but that can happen. So just make sure that you're keeping an eye out for that. And then I think we did have yeah, a question I just wanted to yeah. address um, in the chat box. Um, and the question was whether if you, if a taxpayer has an accepted OIC, so if IRS accepts an OIC, can the IRS reverse it if all of a sudden the taxpayer has a big jump in income? Um, so if the IRS has offered, you know, accepted the offer, 
um, it's been paid by the taxpayer, then no, IRS can't turn around and um, and then later say, wait, 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 we don't want to accept the offer. So sometimes we joke with our clients, you know, if you were to win the lottery, um, you know, after your offer is accepted, you know, the tax debt shouldn't come back on you as long as you're remaining compliant. Um, so I guess that's the good thing for the, the taxpayers there is that, you know, once the offer is deemed accepted by the IRS officially, then, you know, the IRS can't later turn around and, um, you know, revoke that exception. But what the taxpayer does need to remember is that they do need to remain compliant. So there is a five-year um, period where they need to remain compliant with filing their tax returns on time, paying any balances due on time um, to make sure that they don't risk the offer and compromise defaulting. And Chelsea, did you want to add something? Oh, no, I was just going to say, hey, touch on that uh, question if you can. So that was oh, it. great. Um, <laughs> sure. This next slide, since we're just running short on time, I'm going to read it, um, leave it to y'all's leisure to read these cases. Just know that these are some of the most um, recent updates in terms of CDP and collection cases. Um, one's from 2019, the rest are from 2020. Some um, are super recent, just the past couple months. So um, if we have time at the end, I'm happy to go over them more, but for now you guys should all have, um, you, you'll, you either have or you should be getting the slide deck. So I'll let you all look at them yourselves. And with that, um, I think we're switching topics. All right, so I think I'm gonna be covering the first part of our next discussion. This is Josh and um, as was mentioned before, these um, comments and statements that I'll be making are attributable only to me and not to TAS or the National Taxpayer Advocate. So to the extent I say something silly, it's all on me. Um, so what we're going to be talking about in this next section are how to, you know, issues that come up for limited English proficiency taxpayers and taxpayers with disabilities. And we're first going to start out talking about limited English proficiency uh, taxpayers. And I think what these next few slides are going to do is how this will sort of be laid out will be, you know, what is the, what are federal agencies um, expected to do either, you know, under the law or under executive orders and what sort of the scope of this population and what's being done um, to assist them. So first, our first slide here sets out the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which states that um, you know, federal agencies cannot discriminate on the basis of national origin. And then that's followed up here by this executive order that says, um, you know, folk, individuals with limited English proficiency should have a meaningful access to federal agencies and to um, to services provided by organizations that receive federal funding. So, you know, we'll get into that a little bit as to what that means for the IRS and how the IRS has been observing um, that Civil Rights Act and that executive order. But first, um, our next slide just is going to sort of, you know, talk about the, this population. And there's about 25 million individuals who would be identified as limited English proficiency. So English is not their primary language. And here's a, um, a link to the a interactive map of the Civil Rights Division, which sort of can show you what communities, what states, what neighborhoods or areas have um, individuals with limited English proficiency. And, you know, I just think the sort of interesting thing about drilling down on those numbers is that, you know, it may not always play out how we suspect it to play out. Um, there are certain areas in the country that I think we all probably know or identify as being very diverse. Um, but for instance, I'm out here in the middle of the country in Des Moines, Iowa, and, you know, it's a state that is 90% Caucasian, but we do in certain communities have a large 
Spanish-speaking community, and we have a large Vietnamese community because it was one of the few states that um, allowed refu- Vietnamese refugees uh, after the Viet- during and after the Vietnam War. So there's different like stories like that, I think, all throughout the country that sort of can show up when we look into that a little bit more. So, you know, every community is different and every community, you know, it might sort of surprise us. Um, to see that a number of communities that we maybe other wouldn't, otherwise wouldn't suspect um, have a number of individuals who identify as uh, limited English proficiency. And some states have as high as uh, 20% individuals that fall in that category. The next slide is a study done, a customer service study done by the IRS. And this was really trying to identify like where the IRS, you know, needs to zero in in terms of trying to provide services to this community. So here you have um, the top five, you know, um, languages, Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, and Cantonese. And, you know, the largest number of individuals who fall in that category are were Spanish speaking, uh, about 71%. And um, Cantonese actually, as you can see there, is the out of that group was the least likely to speak any English or any other um, any other language. So those were interesting findings um, that sort of you know it, the IRS is using to target you know how to provide services to this community. Okay, so what is the IRS doing? I think many of you are familiar with the -the over-the-phone interpretation system, and um, this is uh, this is on the 1040 line now, not just international lines, and it um, has 350 different languages that can be used, um, you know, to provide those interpretive services, and it also could be used in a TAC environment. And, you know, if, a, if an individual comes into the TAC and they have limited English proficiency, the OPI could be used so the assister, the TAC assister, can help that taxpayer um, with their issue. So, um, you know, about 66,000 individuals used that service. So, you know, it does, it does get um, quite, used, you know, utilized. And... There is another phone system that is specifically used for assisting uh, Spanish-speaking taxpayers. Okay, so the next slide is talking about um, what, you know, with written communication, what the IRS is doing. So this is, there's been some, like, relatively significant developments, or there will be some relatively significant developments going forward. So... There is going to be a checkbox on the 1040 that would identify, um, you know, future correspondence to be sent in a different language. And next year, the 1040 will be provided in Spanish. So I think that, you know, that's obviously those are some great steps. Um, You know, there's a lot of that is being some of that is still, you know, being worked within the IRS. But I do think that there are some interesting issues that could arise from this. So, for instance, if you check the box to receive your correspondence, your written correspondence in, you know, Spanish or Cantonese, and for whatever reason, you know, we all know that the systems don't work perfectly, that notice gets sent out later in a different um, in English, you know, is there any consequence to that? I mean, other than there's obviously a consequence on the on the recipient side, they can't read it. Um, but what if it has, you know, start, comes with uh, statutory implications, a time period, you know, what if it's a stat notice, is it, is it valid? Um, those are questions, I think, that are going to have to be, you know, considered going forward, and I think, you know, we'll have a discussion later down the road um, in terms of uh, accessibility issues for people with disabilities, and I think some similar questions 
maybe um, would arise in that situation as well. So right now, written correspondence is only in some cases sent out in Spanish, and that would have to be done, you know, like a request to receive that. So, you know, I, um, this would be when you can check the box more of a, you know, would remove sort of that manual process where you'd have to make that call, but it's going to be, you know, you check that, and the idea would be that that correspondence would be received from that point forward in that preferred language. Um, the next two slides are really going to be talking, you know, we're really kind of talking about, like, so what does this mean in terms of when you're working with your clients? And, you know, we all as uh, lawyers have these professional responsibilities and obligations, you know, um, when we would get, need to get informed consent from our clients and, you know, sharing with them the objectives of the case and how we're going to reach those objectives and keeping them informed, responding to inquiries, and having discussions about with them about, you know, what our professional responsibilities or legal um, constraints are in terms of um, our representing our representation. And, you know, when you're working with, and I, you know, I, with a taxpayer that has limited English proficiencies, you know, I think this is an important thing, ethical thing to consider, which is how are you going to have these conversations and make sure that that critical information is getting through to the taxpayer. So, you know, we're going to talk about in a little bit, you know, sort of the best practices for communicating with taxpayers where there may be a language, you know, barrier. Um, but you really have to think through, how am I going to make sure that they get this information? How am I going to make sure that they understand if I need informed consent, if we're going to enter into a settlement agreement, you know, with the IRS? Um, you know, how do I make sure that they understand what is, you know, happening? On the other hand, I think the facts and circumstances of each situation are going to be a little bit different. So, you know, not every circumstance is maybe going to allow for that best practice, you know, depending on the situation, can, depending on the time sensitivity, you know, how quickly do you have to act and make sure that the information is being, you know, conveyed clearly, but yet, you know, you may not have the opportunity to have um, the best case scenario in terms of having that interpreter or that translation. So, you know, those are all things that I think are going to, you know, have to be ironed out. Um, next is confidentiality. You know, it's going to be important that, you know, you reiterate that you don't, you know, you're not sharing information unless it's to, you know, and without informed consent except for the standard purpose of trying to resolve the case and that you're taking the necessary steps to ensure that there's no unauthorized disclosure. So, you know, this would be an opportunity to talk to your client that, you know, look, you know, here's, here's the, in terms of communication, here are the barriers, here's how we're dealing with them. But in terms of what you communicate with me, whether it's through an interpreter, that is protected by the attorney-client privilege. And, um, you know, that will be observed, uh, observed to reassure them of that and to make sure that they understand, you know, that they feel comfortable sharing that information because, you know, obviously as um, their representative, it's important that you get the necessary information that you need to best represent them and advocate for them. And I think a critical point to that is going to be ensuring that they're comfortable with the situation by which you sort of, um, you know, are able to get that information from them to to do your your advocacy and, and to represent their their interest. So the next slide is just talking about sort of these different options in terms of, you know, translating or interpreters. And I sort of mentioned this just a second ago in terms of best practices. So if you have, you know, there are highly skilled interpreters that can listen and then translate at the, simultaneously. There's others that, you know, there's going to be more of a pause. 
they have to listen and then translate and then pause and, you know, go back to the other individual. Um, so there are going to be different situations that you have to consider. Um, you know, we get people in our local offices that, you know, will come from a taxpayer assistance center. They come in with, with a notice and they want, you know, they want to know what the notice means. Um, you know, depending on, you know, the, you know, you try to help people as much as you can, but you also want to make sure that, you know, you take steps to ensure that they're fully understanding what the situation is, what, how you can help them and what you need from them um, to best, best advocate for them. So, you know, like I said, I think that's somewhat going to be on a, on a case by case basis in terms of your interactions with your client. I think, um, Nancy, at this point, um, you had some practice tips that you might be able to go over with us. Yes, thanks, Josh. Uh, so you'll see here the first, um, it's, it's actually a resource, is IRS Publication 850, um, which is a glossary of different tax words and phrases. And the IRS is now, now has that available um, in five different languages, um, and that's Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, Russian, and Korean. And this is a really great resource. It's actually something that we use in our office um, when we are training a new interpreter or translator. Um, if it's, you know, in that language, that's one of the first things that we provide to them as a resource because, you know, when you're translating, let's say, offer in compromise in a language and you're sort of taking those words separately, that's not necessarily going to convey the same meaning as offer and compromise when we're talking about the IRS offer and compromise. So I would definitely encourage you to use um, these glossaries as much as they're applicable because they do have these tax terms um, translated. And I think it's, it's really important and it, you know, it just shows how important it is to know the tax lingo um, when you're trying to help a, a taxpayer. So I would definitely encourage you to, to use those as much as possible. Um, and then I think, you know, that also speaks to the second bullet there is that if you're using family members, children, friends, or volunteers, which we have had to use in our office, you know, it really just depends on what your resources are and maybe what the language is. Um, you know, they may not have that tax terminology. So providing the glossary if they can, but if, you know, maybe there isn't a glossary available, it just becomes increasingly more important to make sure that your client is understanding what you're conveying, what they might be agreeing to, um, and that can be difficult, you know, if you don't have the right terminology. Um, and I don't necessarily have a great solution for you. I think, you know, it's really just a matter of trying to do the best you can, trying to find uh, an interpreter maybe in that language. We've reached out to local groups like legal services and, um, refugee group sometimes you know maybe there was a group that sent that client over to us and they might have resources in that language um, and of course i'm talking from the clinic perspective if you know someone's at maybe a larger firm you know then that might be something that um, you know they're working into their fee agreement um, but from the clinic perspective you know we're trying to utilize what resources we can without you know incurring too much cost um, and you know we don't charge our clients so um, so those could be some other tips, you know, maybe reaching out to local organizations to see if they might be able to assist. Um, and then just some other things to consider are listed here. You know, if the notice is originally issued in English and then you're asking, um, you know, for a translation um, of that notice, you want to make sure that you're still keeping in mind any deadlines that may be coming up. You definitely don't want to miss those. Um, and then if you're sending things back and forth to the IRS and maybe that's being sent in another language, it might work, the IRS may require additional time um, to try to get that translated. So perhaps a tip there would be, you know, where possible, if you are providing documentation to the IRS, let's say you're in an audit and you're trying to, you know, provide birth certificates and maybe they're from a different country, you know, if possible, it might be helpful to provide a certified translation. Um, but again, you know, that may not always be possible, but I think it, it might help to move the case along if 
you do provide the, the translation directly to the IRS. Um, so a couple more practice tips on the next slide. Um, you know, it's good to have a plan for interpreting, you know, prior to working with the client, um, you know, setting something up in advance, whether it's, you know, a language line or working directly with an interpreter or a translator. Um, you know, if you are at a, a private firm, you know, that maybe you need to consider that in your fee agreement with the taxpayer. Um, that third bullet is something I've definitely experienced at the clinic where, you know, th there's been times where maybe a client has popped by and, you know, our interpreter or translator isn't available to talk with them and they're sort of trying to muddle through in, in English and, and maybe nodding their head and it seems like they understand. Um, but also, I think it's good to follow up with them if possible and, you know, if you can get a letter in that in their native language, just sort of maybe going over what you discussed in the office to make sure that everything was indeed understood. It's, it's really important to make sure that they understand the process and exactly what's going on and maybe what's expected of them. Maybe you're asking them to, to provide something. So I think even though maybe a verbal conversation would, was had, it could be good to follow up uh, in written form as well. Um, and, and so lastly, with that last bullet, again, I think, you know, if your client wants to speak in English, you know, it may still be good to have other options or, again, maybe to follow up um, in written form to make sure that everybody is on the same page when it comes to that, that meeting or whatever was agreed upon. Um, I don't know if anyone has any other tips they want to jump in with here, um, but that's, that's what I have as far as um, some tips for using translators and interpreters. Um, so moving on to representing um, low English proficiency clients in tax court, it's important to note that all of the tax court proceedings are in English and the reporting and the transcribing is done in English. Um, further, the documents that are filed with the tax court must be in English, but if something is not in English, you should be providing a certified translation, which is essentially a translation that the translator um, it issues a signed statement with it indicating that the translation is a true and accurate representation of the original document. Um, and the standing pretrial order does inform litigants, um, you know, that the process and the documents should be in English. Further, the litigants are expected to provide their own language interpreters for tax court proceedings. And you can refer to Tax Court Rule 143F, um, which says that the parties ordinarily will be expected to make their own arrangements for obtaining and compensating interpreters. However, the tax court may appoint an interpreter of its own selection and may fix the interpreter's reasonable compensation. Um, which may be paid by one or more of the parties or otherwise as the tax court may direct. So um, I think it's, it's important to let the court know as early as possible, and we talk about this a little bit on the next slide, to inform the court that you have a client that may need interpretation services. And the next question, I guess, is what if the petitioner can't afford an interpreter? Um, so, so generally, the petitioner no later than 30 days before trial would need to file a motion with the court to um, request that the tax court pay the expenses of an interpreter. But the petitioner does need to explain that three conditions are met and they're listed there. Um, first, that a language barrier does exist. Also, that the taxpayer doesn't have the financial means to pay for an interpreter. And lastly, that the case does present a substantial question, which is not frivolous. So I think that's important because language access should not be a bar to a taxpayer, um, you know, getting to have their day in court or, you know, seek re the resolution that they feel that they're entitled to. Um, but, but I think the key point here is that you want to let the court know ahead of time as soon as possible. And we talk about this a little bit on the next slide as well. Um, 
nowadays with a lot of the tax court proceedings being virtual and the tax court is generally using Zoom Gov, um, I think it can be an even a little more complicated when you're doing all of this on video. So it's, it's good to let the judges chambers know ahead of time, um, you know, that you will have an interpreter on hand. Um, and, and then if you are seeking, you know, that the tax court pay for the interpreter, you do want to remember that the interpreter is for the benefit of the tax court judge or the trial clerk. And if you separately want to try to use the interpreter to meet with your opposing counsel, then that is something you would need to ask the judge if you can use the interpreter. So technically, it's not your personal interpreter. It's really sort of the court's interpreter, um, so to speak. But I, I think the court's preference would be to have everybody on video so it doesn't look like anyone's being sort of coached, you know, off screen, um, you know, so that you're really simulating what would be the experience in court. And I think that's the same, you know, whether it's a you're actually having the trial or if it's a pretrial conference, just letting the court know um, ahead of time. And, you know, we've done that even as early as, you know, in the the tech the Taxpayer has filed the petition, and then we're also filing a waiver of the filing fee. So we've had clients where we've mentioned in the filing fee waiver request that the taxpayer doesn't speak English, and, and the form has been filled out, you know, through translation services. Um, so that way you're sort of reminding the court um, all along that there may be some, some language access issues. Uh, Nancy, this is a quick the next question. Slide. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question in the box is, are there anyone on the on the group aware of any type of extension that's given due to translation issues? I'm not personally aware of anything in a IRS response or a tax court. And obviously with tax court, you can always ask the judge for additional time. It may be a, you know, a motion for some sort of extraordinary relief or to, you know, something in a status report, but answer, are you aware of anything and maybe more of a procedural as opposed to a tax court matter about extensions due to language issues? No, I can't say that I'm aware of anything like that. I mean, maybe the closest thing in a tax court context would be, you know, if, if it's sort of a last minute thing and the taxpayer needs an interpreter and the court can't provide one, it's possible maybe the court would consider a continuance if, the case is likely to settle. And maybe, I don't know, Chelsea, if you want to chime in on that too. Um, but as far as, you know, procedurally outside of that context, I'm not sure um, that the IRS would necessarily grant an extension just based on language access. But I think that's one of the questions, you know, Josh was mentioning earlier with the the 1040 and you're marking, you know, whether you'd like to be contacted in another language, it really poses an interesting question because if you do mark the return and say, I want to be contacted in another language, but then the IRS continues to correspond with you in English, you know, are those notices still valid? Um, and I think that's going to raise some, some interesting questions down the road. Yeah, and I think those questions are still sort of hanging out there. I would say that in terms of your administrative um, you know, your administ administrative procedure, if you are, as a representative, are working out, um, you know, interpreter issues or getting information from your client, um, you know, and say the IRS is getting ready to file, you know, a lien or a levy or take some sort of collection action, that, you know, you should try to work with collection and get them to put a hold on the account until you can get those those issues resolved, I would say that generally they should be um, cooperative, you know, in doing that. But if you had problems, then, you know, that would be something you'd want to come to TAS for um, and we could help you with that situation. And I don't yeah, know. Yeah, and I've dealt um, with this, Brad, uh, so I was going to say, I was, I've dealt with this in a little slightly different situation where the IRS is auditing individuals for their foreign tax credit and they want supporting documentation from another country, right? And so obviously it's a different situation, but um, usually, you know, they've been willing to pretty reasonable if you need more time to get documents translated, right? So just you have to explain why you're going to need more time, and it's pretty common. 
And I don't know um, about an extension of time, um, but I did want to mention, since we're talking about um, translators, um, and we, I don't believe anyone's mentioned it yet on the call today, that if you've got a case in tax court and you are working with a counsel attorney, obviously on the other side, um, counsel does have um, limited um, translator interpreter services. Um, so I know specifically we can do Spanish, Creole, Mandarin, Korean, Vietnamese, Somali, Russian, French, and Arabic. Um, and then there are also some counsel attorneys who act as um, translators or can act as translators um, for some other languages like um, Hungarian, uh, Armenian, Danish, Farsi, Greek, Portuguese um, is the list I'm seeing right now. So again, that's only, that's not for administrative proceedings before the IRS. It would only be if your case is in tax court and you know, you're know you working with counsel at that point. But I did just want to mention it um, so that you all know in case um, you do have a case um, in tax court and you're worried about translation services. Great. I think that's that's really good to know, Chelsea. I wasn't aware that you had so many of those resources, so that's that's really good to know. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to the next slide here, representing hard of hearing or deaf litigants. Um, and here it's just important to remember that there is no universal sign language. So other countries may adopt ASL, American Sign Language, or use another sign language. So. If your client is deaf or hard of hearing, it's important to check if ASL is their um, language or if they use another primary language. You shouldn't just assume that they use um, ASL. And I, I have had a case where we were actually referred by um, a local organization that was working with our client who was deaf. and. Um, you know, they sent her over, and because we didn't have um, resources to interpret for her, the client agreed and signed a form um, enabling us to communicate to her through her caseworker from this local organization um, who spoke English and also ASL. So we were able to arrange meetings um, in person, and she was able to translate. So because she wasn't, you know, an official translator interpreter, obviously we have to use a little bit of caution in that situation. Um, and then we did get a, a signed agreement as well, you know, making sure that the taxpayer was in agreement that we could communicate with her caseworker. Um, so moving on, I think, you know, as far as the tax court is considered, the Petitioner, if they're in a similar situation where they're deaf or hard of hearing and um, they need an interpreter uh, for American Sign Language, ASL, the petitioner can file a motion pretty similar to what they would do um, if it was another language um, for a hearing client. They would file a motion requesting that the court provide an ASL interpreter. So that is, there is that option available. And moving on to the last slide, so the, it does appear that the IRS is really making some positive strides in language accommodations and access, but if you do have concerns or questions, um, here's some contact information where you can reach out to the IRS um, to, to raise those uh, questions or concerns. And I think with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Josh. Okay, great. So I'm going to focus um, the, the last part here on a couple slides that discuss some other issues um, regarding taxpayers with disabilities. So there actually has been sort of a recent development in this area. Um, some com complainants in the National Federation of the Blind had um, filed a complaint that the IRS was in violation, the Treasury Department and the IRS was in violation of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which requires that any executive um, agency or any organization that receives federal funding provide equal access um, to individuals with disabilities. And the complaint here was that there was no um, systemic way to get print um, correspondence 
to these taxpayers. And these were um, all visually impaired or blind taxpayers um, that, you know, were arguing they didn't have any way for the IRS to get them this material that they, in a way that they could read it and um, therefore was in violation of the act. And the National Federation of the Blind on July 15th announced that they had entered into a settlement agreement with the IRS. And this settlement agreement says that the IRS will work to develop a process by which these taxpayers or taxpayers with disabilities can, um, you know, obtain these print material in a uh, accessible format, will improve its electronic um, communications, and will look to try to provide audio information or audio note correspondence, and um, will work with external stakeholders on these issues and improving its communication and its um, accessibility and making individuals aware of these options. And, um, you know, I think that this is, so this is scheduled to be rolled out in January of 2022, and it's currently being worked right now um, within the IRS, uh, the implementation of this settlement. And I think, you know, some of the issues that came up with the LEP taxpayers could come up here in terms of, you know, if you request something in Braille, what does that mean? Um, you know, and if you don't receive it in Braille um, and you miss a deadline or you you don't, you know, you can't, you miss the stat notice. And if you say, I'm going to, I expect all my stuff to come um, in Braille and then, you know, you you're not expecting it and it comes in print, you know, so you, you miss the deadline, you know, is there a consequence to that? So I think those are the issues that are hanging out there. I will say that I also think that this poses some interesting um, issues for the IRS going forward in terms of its continual move towards um, moving customer service online. I think there's a lot of great benefits to that for taxpayers, and I think there's a lot of great benefits to that for taxpayers with disabilities. But I think as probably most of us know, not every website or every application on, on our phones is e created equally. So for a sighted user, it may just be user, you know, it's not user friendly. And for someone who has a disability, a visual impairment or something, it may be that it's not usable at all because it wasn't designed properly. So I think going forward, it, you know, I know the IRS strives to do this, but as it looks, you know, expands and looks into online accounts and getting notices to taxpayers that way, it's really going to have to think about, you know, ensuring that this is, you know, a really um, accessible design that is being implemented. So taxpayers, um, of all abilities or disabilities can can equally access that those accounts and that information. So, you know, I think that's important going forward. So that the implementation of that settlement is, you know, going, you know, is happening right now. And some of those issues, we'll just have to see how they're resolved. I did also want to talk about some other statutory issues uh, that are in the tax code that can affect taxpayers with disabilities. Um, one that can affect affect taxpayers with disabilities, and another one where um, our office has recommended that a change be uh, made to the tax code to better accommodate taxpayers with disabilities. So the first one is under 6511H, which is tolling the time period for filing a refund claim. So one thing here, just generally speaking, as a practicing note, if for some reason you have a client that's blown the time period to file the refund claim and there's no formal, you know, the formal claim hasn't been made, you can't find an informal claim that you can grab onto that's been made, you should look to 6511H because if the taxpayer can show that they are financially disabled, the time period for filing that refund claim can be told during the time period that they are disabled. So financially disabled means that a taxpayer is unable to manage their financial affairs due to a physical or mental impairment that 
is does not uh, occur less than 12 months. So it has to be more than you know 12 months or more, or expected to result in death. Um, the way that this is determined is you will submit. Uh, there's a slide here that has the revenue procedure. You submit um, this revenue procedure instructs you how to submit that claim, and it has to be a medically determinable impairment, physical or mental impairment, and that medical determinable impairment has to be determined by a physician. So it has to be, uh, there has to be a state statement by a physician that says you, um, that's signed, that says that the taxpayer is unable to manage their financial affairs. Um, this all came up from a case, the Brockham case, which is where, you know, an elderly taxpayer um, filed, overpaid, and it wasn't discovered. He was senile, um, had dementia, and wasn't discovered until he passed away, his daughter was going through, and it was too late for him to get that money back. And this was one of the cases that created this exception in the law. And one recommendation that Taz has made was that this be broadened um, for two reasons, um, in two ways and for different reasons. The first reason is, or the first way that it would be broadened would be that the terminology of unable to manage financial affairs would be changed to material, materially limiting, the impairment materially limits their ability, the taxpayer's ability to manage their affairs. And the reason behind that was because in particular, thinking about people that maybe suffer from mental illness. And, you know, so often illnesses and mental illness in particular does not manifest itself in one way. It's usually not an all or nothing thing. You know, maybe, you know, maybe you can, an individual can, you know, go, go to work and appear to be managing things okay, but they're not paying their bills on time. Or, you know, maybe some of their bills they pay on the time, but some of their bills they don't. Or they're, you know, there's just, there's a lot of different reasons. So we didn't, you know, we recommended that it wasn't really this all or nothing test. The other thing was, was that it um, no longer, you know, require a physician, but it'd be expanded to include a licensed mental health professional, like a psychologist or social worker. And, you know, the reason for this is that, you know, that so often are the individuals who are most familiar with the mental health um, issue, you know, disease, and that are trained in that area, and that can really speak to how it's affecting this individual's life. So this issue has also, you know, been brought up by others. Uh, there's been some blogs and procedurally taxing on it. Um, and one of the more recent ones had set out some comments, some ABA comments, um, that this the revenue procedure, this issue about, you know, who can, you know, sign off on this statement, you know, really should be reconsidered because it really doesn't, A, address the issue in the Brockham case, and it's, you know, really limiting that taxpayer's ability to get relief. I mean, I think there's a lot of understanding that the IRS, can't evaluate situations and make, you know, we don't have mental health professionals employed and make determinations as to someone's mental health ability, but we should, you know, there should be a way to make it more accessible for individuals to, you know, to complete that form. And I mean, you see this litigated, um, you know, Fairly regularly, you know, I, I feel like there's always a few cases that are percolating um, through the courts on this issue, you know. So this is just, you know, um, our recommendation that we had made back in 2013, how we, how Taz, um, you know, thought that this could be, you know, these issues could be addressed. There's another area of the law that we thought, you know, we recommended should be, a tolling situation should be included. And that would be um, to return, you know, get the levy proceeds returned. Um, there are situations where if you are a third party, so I'm Josh 
Joshua are back, but if they were supposed to levy me, but they levied Joshua, you know, L back instead, that other person um, could file an administrative claim to get those levies proceeds back. Um, and they could even go to district court to get the proceeds back if they file in the appropriate time period. And same thing with the taxpayer. They, under certain circumstances, can get those levy proceeds back if they file an administrative claim within a certain time period. And you see the time periods there, um, two years from the time that um, the, the levy took place. And, you know, there should be they cannot go to district court, um, however, if it's the taxpayer. But there should be a tolling period in those situations as well. And I, the recommendation is then to add the tolling period and then to have the language that we recommended in 6511H be used, which is, you know, um, limiting, materially limiting an individual's or taxpayer's ability to manage their financial affairs. So, you know, those are... Um, some of the statutory issues. One thing I will say that we had written a recommendation about some years ago, too, that's not actually on here is um, somewhat related to this, which is the taxation of damages. And we had recommended, you know, to this discussion about physical and mental injury, um, that it be expanded to include, you know, mental injury instead of just physical injury, where so if you were sexually harassed and it resulted in physical um you know situation where you could you were losing sleep you you developed uh, mental health problems ptsd um stomach problems that that would be characterized as a physical injury and it should be included in the exclusion of um those damages should be included in as an exclusion of taxation and um, that's another recommendation, just sort of that recognizing, fully recognizing, I think the position at the time that we made that recommendation, the argument at the time was just fully recognizing the mental health component um, and that can have significant physical impacts on people's lives. Um, so th those are um, sort of the highlights. Um, I, there are a lot of resources out there um, that the IRS has already for information for people with disabilities in terms of getting publications and things. Um, they've done, over the years, they've done a really good job at getting those, the Alternative Media Center, getting those in accessible format so they can be more easily read electronically um, and in and, and getting those things off, uh, online. So there is a process by which you can, sort of similar to the LEP taxpayers, you can get those materials, but there's no systemic process where yet, and that's what this agreement settlement was all about, was, was get, you know, checking those, um, signing up for those, and identifying that you would want that going forward, and then not having to continually manually requesting that that information be provided. But I did just want to acknowledge that there, there, there are services out there, but I think this settlement is going to help enhance those services for people with disabilities. Um, okay, so the last slide here is just a little, um, you know, reminder that taxpayer how to get in touch with us at Taxpayer Advocate Service. If you run into any of the issues that are discussed today, um, remember the, you know, just generally speaking, the criteria for which we take cases in, you know, the, we have criteria, whether there be a uh, financial hardship that the taxpayer is experiencing, there is a systemic issue, a delay in getting, um, when you work through normal IRS processes, but contact us and, you know, we will um, get you, you know, walk through that with you or, or the taxpayer and get your case assigned to a case advocate. So um, that is sort of, I don't know if Nancy or if anyone had anything to add on those points, but that was sort of the issues that I wanted to hit on that particular topic. I don't hear Nancy Thanks, or anyone Jeff, else I don't have anything to add. Oh, <laughs> okay. No, I don't have anything to add, so Chelsea, you go ahead. <laughs> 
Yeah, thanks, Nancy, and thanks, Josh. Um, so there's a question that we received um, that I'm going to attempt to answer, and anyone else can feel free to jump in if they have other thoughts. But the question is, going back to the discussion of receipts in the context of CDP, would difficulty in understanding an IRS notice because of limited English ability, deafness, blindness, or other disability, and the need for assistance in understanding the notice be considered in determining when a notice is received? So what I will say to that is I am not aware of any case law um, that says that that would impact receipt. Um, and every case, all the case law that I've seen thus far seems to focus on physical receipt. Um, since someone not being able to potentially read the notice um, for one reason or another um, isn't necessarily going to stop them from physically receiving it, I would say it probably um, is not going to be a determination. Um, about when a notice is received. But again, I've not seen anything out there um, in case law saying otherwise. Does anyone else see anything? Know of anything? I am not aware of anything. No, either. but it might no. be an area, no. yeah, it might be an area for some future litigation. I think that raises some important questions. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't either. I'll just say that, you know, I thought that case that got settled that I just mentioned was really interesting, that it was brought under Section 504 of the Real Rehabilitation Act. I mean, a lot of times you see those issues come up in, like, education law um, and school environments, and I just, I, you know, I'm glad they came to an agreement, but it would have been interesting to see where that would gone would have gone and I just think it would will be interesting to see when they make these changes what you know if there is an equal access argument if you don't don't get it so I mean I just think it might be an area to watch well great and I, I appreciate those comments um, again thank you all to the speakers for putting together this great presentation and for the PowerPoint presentation. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, we will be sending you, after completion of this, a copy of the PowerPoint slides and a link to the recording of this session so that you're able to rewatch any sections that you uh, missed or, or wanted to get a refresher on. We were able to answer all the questions that were in the chat box, but of course, if you have any subsequent questions uh, later on, feel free to reach out to me and I'll be sure to um, get you connected with the right person to answer the questions. Again, today's presentation was put on on behalf of the Community Tax Law Project. For those of you that weren't here the first few minutes, just a reminder, the Community Tax Law Project is a low-income taxpayer clinic based here in Richmond, Virginia, uh, and has was started in 1992 by the former taxpayer advocate Nina Olson. It services taxpayers um, throughout Virginia through pro bono representation with in-house attorneys like Nancy, one of our speakers, David Sams, our executive director, along with a panel of pro bono volunteers throughout Virginia. And we really appreciate everything that CTLB does to benefit the broader Virginia community and providing access to qualified, competent uh, representation to help gather and provide the right responses to the IRS. Today's topics were very uh, important to deal with. Uh, I think people are going to see collection issues, you know, as we continue to move on through the pandemic, and there will be lots of things to make sure you're following through with the statutory procedural, um, just make sure you meet those deadlines and, and make sure you follow up with the IRS in written communication. So with that, uh, if you have any more questions about CTLP, feel free to log on to our website at ctlp.org. Uh, and any support, today's CLE was uh, free, but any support to CTLP is always greatly appreciated, and you can do so on our website. As far as uh, CLE credit or continuing ed credit, uh, again, we have, will be submitting for that credit in Virginia and we will be providing that to you. My understanding from our office that handles that, uh, because of COVID, they are a little delayed in getting the uh, certificates, the approvals and certificates out. Um, so obviously we will get that to you as soon as we can get it processed through the CLE office and back to you. But if you have questions on that, also reach out to me. So with that, we're approaching the three o'clock hour. 
And so I want to make sure to respect everyone's time. Thank you. And again, have a good rest of your day.